Hey guys, welcome back to Field Notes. Uh, we are now in early February. So, you know, winter is you know starting to wind down. Um, we are in the final quarter of our indigo snake surveys, and um, they've been going pretty good. Um, we've found quite a few snakes in the last couple weeks. And uh, yeah, we're starting to transition to some other projects. Um, but today I'm out on the Orion Society's Longleaf Stewardship Center. We had some rain events in the last week that triggered some really big amphibian activity. Uh, we had a big spadefoot emergence, a lot of eastern spadefoots coming out and utilizing the, uh, the big pools that filled up with the heavy rain. Uh, we had tiger salamanders, a big breeding event of tiger salamanders in a few wetlands. Um, so it's been really good if you're an amphibian this past week. Um, and another species that we have here, but in a slightly different habitat, is the spotted salamander. And so what I'm doing today is I'm coming down uh, to a handful of pools that we know they breed in uh, here on the property. And I'm going to be looking for egg masses and see if we have any individuals hanging out under logs or debris around the pools. And hopefully we'll see a few and give me a chance to talk a little bit about their unique ecology. Uh, so let's get to it. Now these small pools may not seem like much to us, but this is exactly the microhabitat that these spotted salamanders are looking for. This is where they're going to be courting and breeding and depositing their eggs. And so a lot of these pools aren't much bigger than a car. You know, they're pretty small. Um, they're not very deep. And they could hold a little bit more water. They're not at full capacity, but... Um, Right now, they're holding enough water uh, to allow for breeding and egg laying. And so, since these pools are temporary, they fill up seasonally. They're not going to have any fish. There's no connection to larger permanent water bodies. And so, there's not going to be any fish. And so, ideally, they're going to lay their eggs now in January, February. And, you know, development's going to happen pretty quickly. And before these pools dry up, the young salamanders will grow enough to where they can metamorph into terrestrial life. And so it's really a race against the clock, uh, just like it is with many amphibians um, that rely on these temporary wetlands. Now, unfortunately, uh, like many places throughout the southeast, this property has seen its share of timber harvest. And so what we're looking at right now is likely due to historic timber harvest, tree planting, tree cutting. So what we're seeing here, this is a pretty big area that's pretty music. Uh, the ground stays pretty wet and collects water in places. Um, but what we're seeing is the result of ditching and bedding years and years ago, where people who grow timber... Um, physically make these elongated ditches, elongated um, little berms to plant trees on. That, that way trees do not become inundated with water and die. And so that is a method and it's highly dis like destructive and it disturbs the soil and wetlands and all sorts of things are negatively impacted by it. And even though it hasn't happened in many, many years prior to the Orient Society acquiring this property, um, we still see um, the artifacts of it today. And almost certainly, back in the day, um, before all that happened, this area out here you know, probably had some really big pools that held water pretty well and were probably the core areas for spotted salamanders. But due to this disturbance years ago, um, much of this area is now just these slightly elongated pools that don't, don't get very big. Um, are separated from the neighboring pools and are just not suitable for salamander reproduction anymore. So here we go. We've got a really cloudy and kind of muddy pool. Um, but this is one of the deeper ones, and unfortunately it's been impacted by feral hogs. Um, we found them kind of rooting around in this, uh, this fall. Um, however, it's still holding water. And salamanders still selected it. It's the pool that has the most eggs in it this year. And so right here, these big old blobs of jelly attached to this grass, um, those are spotted salamander egg masses. And I've counted at least 11 
in this pool. And these things are really cool. Um, you can see here, I'll gently lift them. There's a bunch attached to this one stem of grass. You can see they're really firm, big thick layer of jelly for protection, keep them hydrated. And you can see those little dark spots in there are the eggs, the little embryos in there. They're still circular. And so we know that these were laid fairly recently. These are pretty fresh um, egg masses that happened this week. Now, how these, as these egg masses continue to develop, all these little um, these little embryos in here that look like just little round circles, they'll start to elongate. They'll start to resemble kind of a tadpole shape, um, and eventually, a very tiny salamander with little frilly gills will emerge from these and then they will spend the next couple months in this pool um, snacking on all sorts of tiny little aquatic invertebrates and hopefully growing fast enough uh, to be able to metamorph into a small terrestrial salamander uh, before this pool dries up. All right, so I've been out here flipping a few logs trying to find any uh, straggler adults that haven't gone back into habitat and they're still hanging around and I lucked out. So here we are. Flip this big pine log next to this little wetland and we've got this beautiful young male spotted salamander. Just beautiful spots. You see they're bright yellow on the body and towards the head on this individual they start to turn a little orange. Really really beautiful salamander. So let's get him out here. So we can uh, talk about him a little bit more. However, uh, before I put this log back, I want to check underneath to make sure there's, you know, no more. I don't want to accidentally shift the log and squish anybody. And so, here we go. Under this piece of bark, we've got another little guy. I'm going to get him out of here. Um, also looks to be a small male. Real pretty. And we're going to check some of this other bark. Oh, there we go. We've got another one. And that may be a female. Looks real pretty. I'll go ahead and move her. And then we'll put this log back. All right, so... I've got these salamanders here. I got a little bit of water out of one of the pools just so they you know, didn't dehydrate. I took them over here where it's partly shady. And I want to talk about some of the incredible parts of the salamander's biology. Um, so first of all, you'll notice these really bright spots running down the back of the salamander. Now they're mostly yellow and then on a few individuals, they get orange on the head. Um, this is a form of aposomatic coloration, which is basically a warning to predators um, that this animal may be toxic or at least taste really bad. And in this case, um, they are mildly toxic. They have uh, glands along their tail and um, in their skin around their head where they can produce um, a noxious chemical that makes them taste really bad to predators. It isn't lethal but it's, it's enough to dissuade most predators um, from actually eating them. And so that's really cool. Now another really amazing thing that sets them apart from pretty much every other vertebrate on the planet is they have a symbiotic relationship with algae. And you know, many, many vertebrates do have symbi symbiotic relationships. However, this, th this relationship is taken to the next level. From the beginning, when the uh, salamander starts out as an embryo in an egg in a wetland, there's a very specific species of algae, green algae, that grows on that egg mass. It's found nowhere else in the world that we've found. And so this algae grows on the egg mass, it photosynthesizes, it produces oxygen and carbohydrates, um, and it also feeds off the nitrogenous waste that the little embryos that are developing give off. So both the little salamander embryo is benefiting from the excess oxygen and carbohydrates, and the algae is benefiting from the waste that the salamander gives off. So that's pretty cool. However, in the last few decades, scientists found that this 
green algae not only occurs on the egg masses, but within the salamanders themselves. Now it's unclear whether the algae uh, finds its way inside the cells of the salamander during um, development, sometime through the environment while they're in the egg mass, or whether it's actually passed down from adult salamanders, from their parents, uh, because uh, that green algae has been found inside the cells, uh, particularly the reproductive parts of both male and female adult spotted salamanders. And so it's a really cool complex relationship and there's a lot yet to learn about it, but it's just very, very fascinating that, you know, this is a vertebrate that directly benefits from a photosynthetic organism that's inside their body. Uh, it's just really, really remarkable. Now, these salamanders are usually triggered to migrate to these wetlands in, you know, early parts of the year. Uh, down here, we are on the southernmost extremity of their range. Uh, spotted salamanders have a huge range from down here in South Georgia, um, as far west as like East Texas, and then as far north as Maine, Canada, you know, the Great Lakes region. Um, so they have a huge range. But down here, we typically see them migrating in January. Um, January, February, just kind of depending on rainfall. We occasionally see some uh, before New Year's migrating, but the breeding events usually happen uh, early in the year. So they'll come into the wetlands. Males will lay spermatophores in the leaf litter. Uh, females will pick them up, deposit their eggs on sticks or stems of grass, you know, any sort of structure. And then once the breeding is done, which can be a matter of just a couple days, uh, they will then migrate back into upland habitat like these guys were doing uh, right here. Um, they had moved out of the pools, found a log, and then once we get more rain, um, it'll be safe for them to travel further to where they're going to spend the rest of the year. And typically they'll go underground. They'll be inactive or at least not active on the surface for the rest of the year uh, until we get some more cool rains next winter. Um, and yeah, and it's very, very hard to see these animals down here in the southern parts of their range outside of these migrations to breeding pools. Now, these spotted salamanders are very long-lived animals for, you know, a small salamander. It's believed that these, uh, these spotted salamanders can live anywhere between 20 and 30 years old. And so that's a really good thing when you rely on seasonal rainfall. Um, if there's a period of drought for a couple of years where these wetlands just don't fill or they don't hold water long enough, um, being a 30-year-old salamander allows you to wait out those periods to where we have nice rainy years and then um, your offspring have a better chance at survival. And most of their, most of their offspring don't survive. Uh, a lot of, as much as about 90% of larval salamanders never make it out of the wetland. It either dries up or they get preyed upon by you know carnivorous uh, predatory insects or uh, crayfish or even like herons or wading birds. There's a lot of things that could eat larval salamanders. So it's very beneficial to be a long-lived species if you're having to deal with this seasonal variation in weather and then high predation as, as a larva. Uh, because once you do get large adults, um, then they'll hopefully be on the landscape for many, many years, decades even. Uh, in order to you know, produce the next generation. All right, well, I have, uh, I think I've, you know, disturbed them long enough. Um, they're just fantastic animals, um, but I don't want to keep them out here um, for much longer. I want to put them back under their log. Um, I did hydrate them here. You know, I got them some water so they're not drying out. Um, and I'll put them back and they should be good to go. We've got rain coming in just a couple days and I expect that they will move on into the into the surrounding habitat and I'll have to wait until next year to see them again. Um, but thanks for tuning in. Um, I hope you enjoyed learning about this fascinating salamander and um, yeah, I'll see you guys next month.